reversing and exploiting an Apple firmware update. Okay, so this is the uh, situation that we're in. Uh, I'm assuming that you've already compromised a, a Mac OS X box. This is not like a new method for penetrating a, uh, a Macintosh. So uh, you've rooted somebody's box. You know, say you read uh, the book by Miller and Dizovi, you know, which is a great book. You, know, you found some zero day and you exploited somebody. And uh, you want to maintain control of this box. So um, this guy, um, Jesse Daguano, he like presented a, a talk on uh, OSX rootkits at Black Hat last year. And um, so you could use his proof of concept rootkit. There isn't much work on rootkits uh, on Mac OS X. You know, Nemo did some stuff a long time ago on older versions of Mac OS X. Um, just recently at, at uh, DEF CON, the, um, uh, I guess his name was Bose uh, Erickson. He did like runtime kernel patching of the uh, system table. But there really isn't a whole lot of you know, uh, publicly available rootkits on Mac OS X. But uh, one thing that all these things share in common is that if the user reinstalls the operating system, uh, those rootkits die. They go away. So the thing is, we want to maintain control permanently. So I suppose whatever vulnerability we use to get access to the box in the first place, Apple releases a patch. And if the person that we exploited, they're very paranoid and they reinstall the operating system from media, you know, and they safely update the patch level, we want to still, once we've gained access, we want to permanently have access. So how are we going to do that? Well, there are some things that work to our advantage. Um, what Apple does is they like to release products before they've been fully tested. What they do is they use the, um, the early adopters as basically as beta testers. And then what they do is the products aren't quite ready, but they're shipped. And then they later address bugs and issues with the firmware updates. And uh, a few months ago, I went to support.apple.com, and I did a search for firmware update. And at that time, there was almost 1,000 firmware updates available. So that's quite a large number of firmware updates. And uh, one convenient thing about the Mac world is that the Macs, they, they don't tend to change all that much. Like a lot of machines, they're, you know, hardware-wise, they're quite similar. Whereas in the PC world, this is quite, things are quite different. You know, like a Dell and an Acer and HP, these machines are underneath are actually quite different. So, so uh, this is just to kind of show you on support.apple.com. If you do a search for firmware update, there's all kinds of stuff. So what kind of stuff has Apple issued firmware updates for? They've issued firmware updates for graphics cards, keyboards, trackpads, the Bluetooth adapter, all these things. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, the keyboard. So uh, what can an attacker do when they have control of your keyboard? They can pretty much do whatever they want on your machine if they control your keyboard. So this is a picture of a dog just kind of typing on a keyboard. You know, there's an old expression, you know, um, what is it? Nobody on the, on the internet, nobody knows that you're a dog, whatever. Okay. So uh, if the attacker has control of the keyboard, what can they do? What they can do is they can literally shovel a shell back to themselves. So how do we do this in Mac OS X? Uh, we can use Spotlight. You know, Spotlight is by default you know, installed on Leopard and Snow Leopard. So you type command space, and that activates Spotlight. And the focus is automatically in that box. So you can type terminal, press return. You launch uh, terminal.app. And then you can type that sequence of keys, you know, exec bind shell and so forth, where you replace IP by the attacker's IP and port by the attacker's port number, and then you press return. And what does this do? This literally shovels a shell right back to the, right to the attacker. So um, you can have like a netcat listener, and then you can just literally control that computer. So if somebody has control of your keyboard, that's not a good thing. And some Mac users, they, like, they think they're protected because they use some outbound you know, personal firewall and this like, little snitch, which is a pretty popular product. This doesn't do anything. You can just add, in that keystroke sequence, you can just add a, a return. And the default option for a little snitch is just to let, let the network connection go outbound. So what, what can we do? If we control like, the keyboard, what can we do? We can persist the rootkit. So like say, if our rootkit on, the, on this guy's machine uh, is like is eliminated. You know, the user reinstalls the operating system. What we can do is we can every time the machine boots, we can actually signal to the keyboard, oh, that we're still running. And then that's you know, say using the control USB endpoint. But at some point, if like the if the rootkit has died and the keyboard 
no longer receives that signal, then it know the, the keyboard knows that it needs to send con control back to the attacker. So, uh, so we can keep a rootkit alive even if the host operating system is reinstalled. And the reason why I have a picture of this guy, uh, Terry O'Quinn, is that uh, he plays, uh, I think his name is John Locke on the TV show Lost. And, uh, I don't know if that show is popular around in Europe. Um, any case. Okay. So, um, the, so the keyboards that Apple currently sells, there's uh, three varieties. There's like uh, the top keyboard is like a full, like a USB keyboard. Uh, it came out in August 2007, and it's uh, about 50 bucks. And uh, then they have a Bluetooth keyboard that they came out with at the same time. That's $79. And these are very thin, like aluminum keyboards. And then in March 2009, they came out with a smaller, like a USB keyboard. And just recently, like within the last couple of weeks, they they updated the Bluetooth keyboard. Now the the older Bluetooth keyboard took like three AAA, three uh, AA batteries, and now it takes like two AA batteries. And I don't know what other changes they've made because I haven't had a chance to really look at it. But uh, uh, as far as I can tell, the that top keyboard is the most popular external keyboard because it comes by default with like the Mac Pro, the iMac. And it's the cheapest. I think now the default options have changed, but uh, there was quite a period of years where that that was like the default keyboard that came with a Mac, a desktop Mac that is. So we're going to focus our attention on that keyboard. All right. But in 2007, when Apple uh, issued that keyboard, that the keyboard had bugs in it. Believe it or not, there were problems with it. And uh, on Apple's support forums, you can still find some posts where people are complaining about various bugs in the keyboard firmware. So like you know keys would like you know keystrokes would be missing and various you know problems that they had. So um, this one like uh, it misses like one in every dozen keystrokes. You know so Apple didn't test this product when they released it. So what did they do in uh, April 2008? They issued a a keyboard firmware update. This is the first time I've ever heard of a keyboard firmware update. But in any case, so they issued this thing, and this is the URL that you can go to download it. The only thing is recently Apple changed this. Like uh, Sometime between my presentation at Black Hat and Torcon, they, they changed it. But if you want to get a copy of the original, uh, you know, uh, contact me afterwards. So like the original uh, uh, firmware update, you know, it's this .dmg file with that SHA-1 hash. You download it and say uh, copy it to your desktop. That you, know, you mount that .dmg file and there's like a .pkg file. And uh, if you double-click that .pkg file, most likely, uh, if you have a keyboard attached, it'll, this is the message that will come up if you apply all your patches and, and so forth. So there's a check in there that, uh, that whether or not the keyboard has already been updated. But it doesn't matter. We can bypass that. So if you have the Xcode suite of tools installed, you, you can uh, use this tool, Flat Package Editor, and look inside of .pkg files. You can also use a tool, uh, a shareware tool called Pacifist. So within there, that PKG file, there are two uh, other .pkg files. One is for like the aluminum keyboard firmware uh, update, and the other one's for the Bluetooth uh, keyboard. So we'll, uh, we'll, the first one there, that's for the aluminum key, the external uh, USB keyboard. So take that payload file and uh, drag it to the desktop. And if we double click that, then what happens is there's an applications utility, uh, applications directory is created. Within that, there's a utilities directory, and then within that, there's a Cocoa application. And what the, that, what the, uh, the installer does is it takes that payload and actually uh, runs it in the root directory. But since we copied it to the desktop, it's uh, created on the desktop. So if you run that Cocoa application, that thing also checks if the keyboard needs to be updated. And if your keyboard has been updated, it, won't, it refuses to do anything. So um, the only option there was just to quit. So now what we want to do is, um, so we'll, we can look at that, uh, that uh, Cocoa application. So if we right click and do show package contents, you know, in Mac OS X, like an application is actually a directory with a whole bunch of stuff in it. And so here there's a contents directory in Mac OS X. That Illumina keyboard firmware update, that's the actual binary. And then there's like a resource directory, there's a plist file and all this other stuff. So um, if you want to, you know, uh, learn more about like like having, uh, if you want to have an introduction to reversing on Mac OS X, uh, I recommend uh, Cameron Hotchkey's uh, uh, recon presentation. Okay, so uh, let's look inside that resources directory, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. There's a localization languages, and um, 
All right, so if we look at the, um, that, uh, the thing that was in the contents Mac OS, dire Mac OS directory, this Onlumen Keyboard Firmware update, and uh, we look at it as magic number, it's cafe, babe, and um, in Mac OS X, that's like the magic number for a, uh, a universal fat binary. So we're gonna look at the x86 binary. So, um, and uh, also, um, uh, there's a tool that, uh, called LiPo that you can use to like separate the two. Um, that's, that's kind of an aside. So uh, in terms of like when a keyboard is plugged in, there's a tool that uh, in the Xcode uh, suite of tools that's pretty convenient, and that's uh, IO Registry Explorer. So you can look at devices on the USB bus, and I don't know if you can read this back there, but it gives information about like the, you know, uh, you know, the vendor ID, product ID, and all kinds of various things. So um, kind of like from a high level view, if we look at the, these values for like an updated keyboard, uh, there's this BCD device value, ID, product ID, and vendor ID. So Apple's vendor ID is a 05AC, and this, the US uh, USB keyboard, this thing has a product ID of uh, 0220. And whenever it's been updated, the BCD device value is uh, hex 69, but whenever it hasn't been updated, it's hex 67. So this is, a, this is the mechanism by which these, uh, they can tell that the keyboard has been, whether or not it's been updated or not. That's kind of like a, a, a revision number, so to speak. So, um, and if we look at the output of USB view on Windows, this keyboard it has uh, two interrupt in endpoints. And uh, this, uh, the first interrupt uh, in endpoint has a max packet size of eight. And um, the B interval values for both of them are uh, hex A. So that's like 10 milliseconds. So every 10 milliseconds, these, uh, you know, the host is like uh, querying the keyboard. Okay, so in terms of like tools, in order to disassemble the binary, I just used uh, OTX. I could have used IDA Pro. Um, I don't have a license for IDA Pro. For, to do binary editing, I use this tool called uh, ED. Okay, and uh, one thing is, um, I'm not sure if people here are familiar, there's this law in the United States called the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. And this makes, this can make like reverse engineering kind of difficult in the US. But one of the things is there's an exception in the law. So if you have like, if some company has some software product and then you independently create your own software product, then in order to make your independent software product interoperable with some, this other company's product, you're allowed to do reverse engineering for the purpose of interoperability. So what I've done is I've created a Trojan for uh, Apple's keyboard. And in order to make sure that this Trojan is interoperable with Apple's keyboard, I need to do reverse engineering. So there's no DMCA violation here. Okay. All right, so now, now, now we're gonna step into uh, reverse engineering. So um, that thing, that Cocoa application was checking that, uh, that, you know, that um, the keyboard, whether or not it had been updated or not. So there's like this delegate method, you know, application did finish launching. And this thing does like a number of things. It checks the operating system version. It uses the IO kit uh, framework to like find like the attached keyboard. It checks like the validity of this uh, firmware image file that's in the application bundle. And it uses this function that they call, that Apple calls CRC32. So just for kicks, why don't we take a quick look at this function CRC32. So here, this is a disassembly of this uh, function CRC32. You see the function prolog, uh, ESI and EBX are saved, you know, uh, uh, 16 bytes are allocated on the stack. So the thing is, the, the argument to this thing is a, an NS data object. There's some class method in NS data, and that is the pass, like the actual, that file, that firmware image file. And, um, you know, there's message passing in Objective-C, so uh, it's like uh, we get length, you know, length is called on that thing, and the return value you can see is put into ESI, and then bytes is called on that, on that file, that firmware image file, and that is put into EBX, and then like ECX, EDX, those things are cleared. So there's this very, there's a very little short little loop. So you can see that uh, EDX is kind of used as a counter, and uh, ECX is uh, like kind of accumulating like the, the, the values in the file. So then uh, we just keep on checking whether or not that counter finally reaches the length of the file. And when it does, then what, uh, what ECX has is it has like the sum of all the bytes in the file. So is this uh, CRC32? This is not CRC32, right? This is, this is not even close. So uh, you can, this gives you some idea of like the, the quality of Apple's code. They just, they just did not understand what CRC32 is and they didn't implement it correctly. Okay, 
So uh, in any case, so whenever we were trying to uh, like run the updater, there was a number of places where the version, the, the firmware version was checked. So we had to patch the binary to disable those uh, checks. So a number of places. So this is a couple of places. Uh, so here we uh, make both of those jumps unconditional. Another place, uh, no op that conditional jump. So now those uh, we've disabled the various version checks, and this is what the that Cocoa application looks like whenever you uh, plug in a keyboard that hasn't been updated. This is what it looks like. And then what you do is you click that. Uh, it has like a couple of things, like you know, make sure the power cord is uh, you know plugged in, all this Make sure there's only one keyboard. And when you click that update button, then there's an error message. So there's yet another place where the the version is being checked. So we need to look inside the nib file. So if you're familiar with Mac OS X, the nib file is encapsulates the, the user interface of an application. So recently, like within the last year or so, uh, Apple's changed it to like .xib. Now they're .zip files. But in any case, so uh, if we look at that nib file, uh, in the Xcode suite of tools, there's this tool called Interface Builder, and that's used to lay out applications in Mac OS X. So this is a very simple layout. Uh, there's just like that one window, and there's that update button. But in any case, we can, looking at the .nib file, we can figure out exactly what code is called when you press that update button. So that little inspector tells you that do update in my main controller, that's what's called. So if we look at that, um, that do update uh, routine, like in my main controller. It does like a number of things. It checks that the machine is plugged in. It asks for administrator privileges. Actually, administrator privileges uh, are not, uh, up until the recent security update, administrator privileges was, was not required to change the firmware update on, a, uh, on an Apple keyboard. But I disclosed to Apple at Black Hat that, um, that there was a bug in IO kit, so they recently fixed it. So now, uh, now you do actually need administrator privileges before you didn't. So what that Cocoa application is, is just a wrapper around this tool, HID firmware updater tool, like in the application bundle. Like that Cocoa application just asynchronously calls this thing. And it calls it twice, with like the, first, um, the first time with the, that dash parse argument and the second time with those arguments. So if we look at this uh, HID firmware updater tool, it doesn't have any symbol information. And this is the third place where it checks the keyboard version. It looks at the BCD device, and uh, it won't do anything if it's greater than or equal to hex 68. So, but we can disable that. And that's not a problem. So uh, we just know up that uh, jump of above instruction. And then uh, now we can actually flash the keyboard. Uh, we can just reflash it to like, the current version of the firmware. Because uh, I'm going to be pressed for time, I'll, I'll do demos. Like a, I'll do a demo at the end. OK. So um, if we look at that, uh, that firmware file, it's, um, if you look at, say, the first 32 bytes, this thing is obfuscated by Apple. You can look at that thing that's just it's kind of uh, nonsensical. But they, they, what Apple did was they screwed, they basically just screwed up. So what happens is, so um, that, um, the, the, that, uh, the, that firmware image file, it's deobfuscated on the, the machine. And then whenever you're doing the firmware update, the unobfuscated firmware image is sent over the USB bus to the keyboard. So what we can do is, you know, uh, the HID firmware updater tool does this deobfuscation for us. So that's very convenient. So what we can do is, we've taken over a Mac, you know, uh, we take this uh, obfuscated firmware image from a uh, uh, file from Apple. Then we can, you know, because that thing, unop the HID firmware updater tool unobfuscates it for us, it's, you know, it's, and what we can do is, we can set a breakpoint at an appropriate place like you know, we attach a uh, debugger to that HID firmware updater tool, you know, set a breakpoint at the appropriate place, and then modify that firmware image file in memory, and then send the, um, uh, you know, you know, basically add our Trojan there, and then send the the Trojan firmware image file to the keyboard. And when we, when we do that, then we also own the keyboard too. Okay, so let's take a quick uh, look at the how Apple did the obfuscation. It's just terribly done. It's just uh, hilarious. So let A be this 83-byte uh, sequence, and let B be this 53-byte sequence. Then this is what the deobfuscation algorithm uh, starts off with. It reads like the firmware image file, like an 83-byte blocks, and then it does this thing. And then um, it, it does further stuff. It's, this is not cryptographic, obviously. It's, um, 
it's just just some uh, crappy uh, obfuscation algorithm that they came up with. And uh, okay, so we, you know, I won't discuss that thing further. It's just they, they just did a crappy job. So and it's a truism in computer security. You know, don't do security through obscurity. But that's exactly what Apple did. So this is a screen grab from the movie Office Space. Hopefully everybody has seen this movie. So, okay. So um, so we can take that unobfuscated firmware out of memory very easily when we're running this tool. So we attach GDB to that tool, set a breakpoint at that uh, address, and then whenever we run it with those arguments, then uh, we can just dump the unobfuscated firmware out of memory very easily. So this is what uh, this is what it looks like. This looks a little bit more regular if if you see these r this red. So I'll explain uh, exactly how this thing is like formatted. What it does is there's like three bytes followed by 32 bytes, three bytes followed by 32 bytes, and, and so forth. So okay. So now we need to figure out how does this uh, firmware update get sent to the keyboard in the first place. So the keyboard it doesn't have a interrupt out endpoint. It only has like a control endpoint endpoint zero, and then has like these two interrupting endpoints. There's no out endpoint, so there's no way that the host can, uh, it, it doesn't use the interrupt endpoints to send the firmware image. What it does is it has to use the control endpoint. And that function in HID firmware update, you know, hex uh, 20 C3 does it. And what it does is it calls this, um, an IO USB device class, it calls that routine. So luckily, um, what we can do is we can just set a breakpoint there and then just look at the arguments and then figure out what's what's going on. Because what I, I don't have is I don't have a like a USB analyzer. You know, so um, okay. So we attach a GDB, set a breakpoint there, run, and then we can look at the arguments. And uh, uh, we can just we can like the we can go to opensource.apple.com, look at the this uh, USB, uh, the source to their USB uh, stack. And uh, so we look at this struct for the IO USB dev request. We can see, we can like pick this thing apart. So um, the, this BM request is hex 21, then, uh, then there's a B request. This is like, an, if you look at the USB standard, this is like a set underscore report request. Then the next thing is this uh, W value and has these values. This index value is zero. Um, the length is just one, and then the actual data that's just sent is just hex A. And um, so, in order in, in order to put the keyboard into like a bootloader mode, what you do is you just send like a set report to the keyboard to the control endpoint with uh, these values. And then, then what happens is that the keyboard it was uh, it was originally a keyboard, and then it drops off the USB bus, and then it reenumerates as a as a, this keyboard bootloader. Okay, and this is a little bit hard to see. This is the output of a, a USB prober, I think is the name of the application. So it has like, um, you know, it has an interrupt in and out endpoint. And uh, so this is, this uh, now the keyboard has actually, it's, uh, it's now like this, it's no longer a keyboard. It's this KBD space bootloader, and then we send the firmware update to this, to this thing. So uh, we can look at the, the stuff that's being sent to this keyboard. We have set the breakpoint in the appropriate place and see what's being sent. So um, we can and uh, is we can completely reverse engineer this thing. It's actually very simple. So um, you know the commands to the bootloader, you know this uh, bootloader password, like the, how the data is formatted, how the checksum is calculated, and the return values. All of this can be determined. So uh, why don't we quickly look at like the, an example of a, of a kind of a, I call them packets, but uh, it's, I don't remember what the exact USB terminology, but it's it's kind of like a uh, 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 the, I'm just using packet as kind of a it's not like an official USB term or anything. So if you look at this um, the data that's sent to that uh, keyboard bootloader, the first two bytes that is the bootloader command, and there's four possible commands. FF38, like to enter the bootloader mode, write to flash memory, verify flash memory, exit bootloader. Those are the four command, possible commands that I was able to determine. And then the next eight bytes is like a, a bootloader password of sorts. So, and that's what the password is. It's just 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. If you change any of those values, then it, it assumes that something is wrong and then it'll quit. So that's the bootloader password. And then the next two bytes is a block number. You know, the, it's like we're writing to flash memory, and you know, you can't just write like a single byte of flash memory. You have to write like a block, and the block size is 64 bytes, and you're sending it over a half block at a time. So there's a block number, 
And then the next byte is either 0 or 1, depending upon whether or not you sent the top half or lower half. And then the next 32 bytes, that's like the half block. And then the next byte, all that is is just the sum of all the previous bytes uh, mod uh, hex 100. So, so you send this thing across, and then there's a value that's sent back. And all you have to do is just look at the first byte. So, and we can completely determine all the possible return codes. You know, these are the return codes that I could uh, determine. So hex 20, that means there's no error. You know, um, these, other, these are other possible things. Say, for example, like uh, if you make a mistake in the checksum calculation, then you get like a communication checksum error. <coughs> okay. And the thing is, so each one of these packets has a checksum, and then there's, a, there's a yet another checksum at the very end. And so uh, what that checksum is, it doesn't checksum over like the, the metadata, to sort of speak. It's just over the, the various half blocks. So all we do is we just keep adding up all these possible half blocks. And um, you see, like, that, that first 32 bytes, that sum is D89, and then the first 64 bytes is you know, 166E, and then we add up the whole, uh, like, the whole firmware image. Then it's that sum is 4E41B. Then what we do is, uh, in the very last write packet, right before the, the, uh, the checksum for the packet, we put the, that application checksum where we mod it by uh, hex 1000. And we store that in a big Indian format. So that's all there is. These are each individual packet has a checksum, and then the whole thing has a checksum. And uh, and one thing is there, there's no cryptographic, there's no like cryptographic checksum here. And there's, that this is literally everything. So uh, they they didn't code, they didn't do any code signing. This is this is what makes the whole hack possible, and Apple's failure to do any kind of uh, remotely decent uh, code signing. So now, so now we understand how the firmware update process works. In order to be able to tamper with it and install malware, we have to kind of look at the underlying hardware. So if we uh, open up the keyboard, this is what it looks like inside. This thing is not, not really designed to be taken apart. There's like glue and all this stuff there. Yeah, there's no like, there's no screws. Like it lo some people think that uh, that you can remove these things and there's screws underneath. There are actually no screws. It's glued tightly together. So let's take a little closer image. So there's like a there's a USB hub there. On each side of the keyboard, there's actually like USB ports. So there's a hub, there's a, there's a ribbon cable, there's a serial W prom, and then there's a microcontroller. So let's look at the microcontroller. So it's from a Cypress Semiconductor. Uh, it's an 8-bit microcontroller. It has a Harvard architecture. And there's we're not there's not very there's not a lot of space in this microcontroller. There's 256 bytes of RAM. An 8K of flash. So um, it, I think what Apple did was they just literally, they must have like the exclusive rights to this chip now because if you go to Cyprus and you want to buy this chip, or you want to request a sample, they won't send you one. And the data sheet is no longer on Cyprus's website. But I was able to find it online. Um, okay. So just uh, quickly look at the architecture of this thing. The program counter is 16 bits. You know, in order to be able to uh, address 8K of memory. You know, uh, it, can, it can't be 8 bits, you know, it's got to be more. Then, um, you know, there's an, yeah, there's an accumulator, which is like a, just a general purpose register. There's an 8-bit stack pointer. And on this architecture, the stack grows upwards. Uh, there's like this index register that's used to like hold offset values. And uh, there's this uh, flags register. And there's not a whole lot of flags in this uh, thing. It's not like, like e-flags or anything. So the flags register is just 8 bits. There's like a global. There's a bit for whether or not global interrupts are enabled. Like depending upon the result of the last arithmetic calculation, you have like a zero or carry flag. And this thing actually has a special state, the supervisory state. And this is kind of like a, um, this is a special state where, uh, you know, that's whenever you're actually writing to flash on the microcontroller. That's what that supervisory state bit is. And, um, in order to mess with the flags register, there's actually special instructions for that. Okay. All right. So, and then the for the uh, interrupt uh, interrupts for this thing, th these are the interrupts. And um, I don't know if people can read that. It's it's not real important. To... <coughs> so there's they have a special supervisory system call, and this this is what um, is kind of unusual about this chip that allows it can just change its own flash. And so it has a number of like functions, and what's most interesting to us is that write block function. So um, 
you know, if we set these various uh, registers to various values, we can actually, it can, the chip can change its own flash. It's really quite cool. So whenever you're dealing with like a USB product, there has to be, whenever you're like developing a USB application, there's like some separation of, uh, of like when, uh, what the firmware does and what the serial interface engine of the microcontroller does. So there, this uh, Cypress chip, it takes care of like uh, putting data, you know, translating, formatting data, like computing the CRC stuff, the device address checking, you know, that seven bit value that each USB device gets, uh, handshakes and all this stuff the annoying like bit stuffing, non stuffing. That's what the serial interface engine takes care of for us. What, what our firm what the firmware has to do is has to take care of enumeration, uh, filling and emptying like the FIFOs and these kind of things. There, another chip on that uh, little um, a little uh, board is a, there's a uh, serial double E problem. It's an SPI serial double E problem. This is very much just a commodity part out oh, here. And then there's this uh, USB uh, hub controller. So, um, you know, uh, there, there, this thing could support up to four ports, but Apple just uses three. So what happens is one of them is wasted, one of them the keyboard is plugged in, and then the other two are on the sides. And that double E problem is used to configure this thing. You know, they, the vendor ID, product ID, and various stuff is put in there. So this keyboard is actually a compound device. We have like the, the upstream USB connector. We have the hub, the double E problem, which configures the hub. The two USB ports on either side, one USB port is wasted, and then the keyboard itself is plugged into one of the ports. So uh, I need to skip some slides. These are not real. Okay. So um, when we look through the uh, unobfuscated firmware image and we like disassemble it, this is like uh, this is what we get. And uh, the, in the very beginning, what we have is like we have like a relocated interrupt vector table. So we just look at, you know, the first couple of values. There is, um, uh, let me, actually, I want to skip various things. Uh, let me, uh, this, the, yeah, this, let me just skip that. Okay. Um, actually, you know what, maybe, uh, yeah, actually, let me skip these things. What I've done is, um, what I've done is, um, I have like a number of exploits that I've uh, released. One is just changing the lead on the, the keyboard. It's not a big deal. Another one is changing like enumeration, uh, changing like a, a vendor string in uh, enumeration. It's these are these are these are kind of really just kind of lame actually. So okay, so now um, the thing is, if you if you look at that firmware image, uh, uh, if we look at this instruction set, hex 30 is the halt instruction for this uh, microcontroller. And um, so here I have this uh, image. Uh, wherever it's red, that's hex 30, and wherever it's blue, it's anything but hex 30. So you can see that right in the very middle, there's all these uh, halt instructions. And what that is, that's, that's free space. So uh, we can use that free space for whatever we want. So um, let me just do a quick, let me quickly remind you how uh, interrupt transfers uh, work on USB. So here, the, uh, what's shaded that's what the host does, and what's white, that's what the, the USB device does. And so um, here, you know, for this keyboard, we don't have any, uh, we don't have any interrupt, uh, we don't have any interrupt out endpoints, so only the left-hand side of this figure is what's important. So we have the, and, and remember, USB, it's completely, like, host-centric, you know. The host does everything. So, like, the host sends an interrupt, uh, it sends an in token to the keyboard, and what the keyboard does is it does one of these three things, you know. You know, either sends data back or sends a knack or a stall. And it shouldn't send a stall unless there's some problem. So, like, um, the, what the keyboard is doing is it's constantly, the host is constantly querying the keyboard at least once every 10 milliseconds. And if, there, if the user hasn't done anything, uh, then a, a, a knack is sent back by the keyboard. But if, like, the user has, you know, pressed the key, then, or lifted up a key, or whatever, then the data is sent back to the host, and then uh, the host acknowledges this thing. And uh, this, is, this is kind of like a simplistic view, actually, because it's, the keyboard is plugged into a hub, and then the hub is it's actually high speed. It, you know, the bus is a, it's actually a high speed bus. There's like, you know, there's like C splits and S splits and all this like transaction translation and stuff. But th this is this is for our purpose from the from the point of view of the the keyboard firmware. This is good enough. 
So, you know, in token comes in, we either knack it or send data back, and then we, the host acknowledges it. So what we can do is, um, the, what's of interest is like intercepting keystrokes that the user types and sending our uh, keystrokes, sending our own keystrokes back to the host. How do we do this? It's actually very easy. All we do is the endpoint buffers. All we do is we just, you know, there's a routine that fills that uh, buffer. We can just modify that routine and do whatever we want. So, um, so this uh, this range of uh, register values. Um, uh, uh, memory values like hex 58 to, to hex 5f. This is the, the like the FIFO for interrupt um, for the interrupt in endpoint uh, one. Okay. I have 81 written there because it's a standard that when you have like a I guess when you have in then the the high order bit is set. It's the first interrupt in endpoint. So like this these memory uh, low. Uh, these, okay. These memory locations in the microcontroller, they see like all the keystrokes that are being typed and stuff. So just so it's clear what I'm talking about, I took <coughs> I took um, like a Windows Vista box and I've got like USB Lizer running on it, and I plugged in the keyboard and I I pressed the return key and I lifted it up. So that first uh, sequence of eight bytes, the zero zero, and I think that's. Yep, 28, I think it is, yeah. 0, 0, 28, you know, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. That's when I pressed the enter key down. And then when I lifted that, uh, my finger off of it, then the zero, zero, all zeros goes across. So that's exactly that, the FIFO for that interrupt in that point. Okay. So like in the very beginning, uh, I was talking about like a, you know, shoveling a shell back to ourselves, you know, using control command space to launch spotlight and so forth. So this is what we would actually see. We'd have the command uh, pressed down, space pressed down, command lifted up, and then space lifted up. This is what this is what the buffer looks like. Then when we type, uh, you know, we type T, press T down, lift it up. We have those two lines. Press E, lift it up. Press R, lift it up, and so forth. This is what this is what's actually happening. So okay. And uh, okay, so there's a routine that um, in the firmware that actually copies stuff into the uh, endpoint buffer, and this is the routine. So um, in the firmware, it's calling this routine whenever it wants. It has like a there's some memory, you know. There's has to, you know, the the keyboard firmware has to like decode this matrix, and then figure out like what key was pressed and so forth. And with, there's like a memory location where that stuff is stored. So that address, well first, in, uh, that address is put into memory location, um, memory location, which one is it? Uh, I guess that's X. And then uh, 32, we copy, you know, this routine is used for more than just uh, the keystrokes. It's also used for like enumeration and various things. So like 32, we put in the endpoint number. So when we're actually dealing with the keyboard function, we put like a one there. Like 33, we'll have eight. and uh, I, I, I meant to have a comment for 22, uh, but I, it doesn't really matter. So um, this is like uh, this is from like Apple's firmware. This is the this is the routine that does like the, the heavy lifting, to sort of speak. Okay, so this is uh, this is all done. So um, actually, let me forget this. Uh, um, okay, so um, this is this routine 0d51. Uh, whenever the user presses a key or lifts a key on the keyboard, this thing gets Called uh, every single time, so this is we're gonna what we're, we're gonna want to do is we're gonna want to patch this thing. This is kind of like like hooking, like in like rootkits and stuff. So this is what the the left hand side. This is what the the original firmware looks like. That routine 0 d 51. And remember that hex 1000. We have all this free space. So what we'll do is uh, that instruction is 0 d 51. What we'll do is we're gonna we're gonna just jump to the free space. And then in the free space, we put this code here. Oh, um, uh, one more thing I wanted to say is uh, what I'm doing here is I'm actually explaining this. Uh, this, uh, this is actually a really lame exploit. I'm just trying to explain this. What it is is um, I'm just disabling the W key on the keyboard. I'm showing how to do this. It's just, it's just as an illustration. Okay, so so like we jump to the free space, and in the free space, what we're doing is we're looking at uh, location uh, 67. And uh, we're comparing it to 1A. So if uh, I guess, w yeah, 1A, that's like that corresponds to the W key. So um, if it's uh, not 
If it's not the W key, then we just we go to 1008. So that's like that's like what was originally there. If the if if it's not the w, the W key is not pressed, we just do what we were originally supposed to do, and then we jump uh, we jump back up to that zero uh, D57. But if it was the W key, then that uh, that line that uh, instruction at 1005 is executed, and we just overwrite it with zero. So what this does is this effectively disables the W key. So so this is I'm just this is just for. Uh, this is not an, uh, there's nothing really important. All right, so um, what we can also do is we can also intercept the keystrokes and store them. So we can this is this is the this is like the main uh, the main payload. This it's a firmware keystroke logger. So here the way that this keystroke logger works is that I didn't want to make a tool that could be immediately used for attacks. What I do is um, I the key the keystrokes are coming in and I look at um, like uh, if, uh, what I do is I'm storing like the key st keystrokes that the user types in the the FIFO that um, the endpoint buffer that backs the second interrupt in endpoint. So there's a okay there's a there's a very small amount of space there, and um, but the only thing is when the in order to retrieve that stuff I use the return key. So I, I you know I store stuff there and then I uh, use the uh, uh, return key to. To, to, to retrieve that stuff. So what I had to do is like hex 28, see in 1006, I had to check whether or not uh, the return key was pressed. And depending on whether or not it was pressed, I go, there's uh, one of two sets of code that's executed. Um, so um, yeah, I, um, I want, really want to do this demo. So um, this is a, um, so I, when I, this is like a firmware keystroke logger. So let me, uh, let me demonstrate this. Uh, okay, let's see. Whoops. Okay. Um, okay. All right. So um, just to, just so you can see that this uh, you know this uh, keyboard is you know working okay. Wait, was it? Oh, sorry, it's not plugged in yet. Okay. So it's it's uh, it's everything's it's you know uh, it's you know working okay. So okay. So now what we'll do is I'll attach uh, GDB to it. Uh, let me see. I need to. Um, so let me, uh, whoops, where did it? Oh, it's over here. Sorry. Uh, one thing is, I had like a 75-minute slot at Black Hat, so that's why, and I only have a 50-minute slot here. So I, these other demos I can't do. You have an application, so if everyone agrees, we can continue. Oh, okay, okay. So let me. Okay. Yeah, let me. Uh, so this is the uh, the firmware keystroke logger. So I've attached a GDB, and then um, so now I just uh, what I do is I set a breakpoint at the appropriate place, run it, hits the breakpoint. The firmware image has been uh, has been unobfuscated in memory, and then I change the firmware in memory, and then now the the new firmware image is going across the USB bus. And uh, okay, so now this now I have installed a a, uh, a, a firmware keystroke logger in this thing. So let me demonstrate this. What do people want me to type? <laughs> I can type anything. Uh, deep sec. So let me say, okay, so D E E P S E C. So remember, I use the return key to retrieve things. So I use it. Everybody sees that? I'm doing it in re uh, reverse chronological order. Does everybody see this? What I've done is I took the. the um, you know, I take the keystrokes and I, I store them in this uh, the FIFO that backs the interrupt uh, in endpoint two, and then I, I use the the reason why I use the return key to to retrieve the keystrokes is because if somebody takes this and then tries to use it right away, somebody will realize there's a problem when the return key doesn't work correctly. You know, there's there's a reason why I do that just so I don't get myself into any kind of trouble. Okay, so let me. Uh, okay. All right. So um, yeah, so this is like a, this was a, a proof of concept keystroke logger. Like I've, um, it's deliberately neutered. I, I use the um, that uh, that FIFO buffer. It really wouldn't make sense to do that. What you would really want to do is you really want to store it in RAM. That's where you if you want to make a weaponized keystroke logger, that's what you would do. So I've neutered it because you have to use the return key to re, uh, retrieve the keystrokes. It only stores a small number of keystrokes because it uses that eight byte buffer. 
But if you wanted to, what you could do is um, that free space and using that supervisory system call, you can actually write uh, keystrokes to that flash. You just have to make sure like that the checksums will, that the whole application checksum still works. And you can write a keystroke logger, a firmware keystroke logger that stores like a, a thousand or so keystrokes. So um, this could be useful, like say, if you wanted to steal somebody's whole disk encryption key. Because if you've owned their box, then uh, you may not want to like, you know, um, you know, uh, you know, I guess in memory, like the, the key schedule might be there, but it might be painful to recover the actual whole disk encryption key. So you can, you know, this would be one way to do it. So other stuff, uh, do we need physical access to get the keystrokes out of the keyboard? Actually not. Like there was a, you know, like the academics like thought about this a while back. And so um, Matt Blaze at the University of Pennsylvania, he had a paper where if you had like a, a keystroke logger, like a hardware keystroke logger on somebody's computer, and you weren't able to get physical access to that computer again, how would you retrieve the data? What they did was they used, uh, they introduced timing delays, and then they exfiltrated bits of data over interactive protocols like SSH, VNC, and so forth. And um, so, um, yeah, don't use Apple keyboards. You know, and you, I don't use Apple keyboards, period, actually. So, like, the thing is, like, one of the things is, suppose, like, even though these are nice little thin keyboards and stuff, if you use it in your data center, there could be very unusual attacks would become possible. So, okay. And the natural question is, what about the keyboards and uh, MacBooks and MacBook Pros and so forth? Uh, they also have the same problem. The uh, exact range of vulnerability, that I don't know. I don't know exactly when Apple introduced this problem, but it's, a, it's like in the, this is like a, a, a pre-aluminum unibody key, uh, MacBook, a pre-aluminum unibody MacBook Pro. This thing, the keyboard, the firmware here is vulnerable. So um, probably within the, I'm, I'm, if I had to make a guess, I would say probably when they switched to the Intel platform, that's when Apple really screwed up. So, um, so that we have this situation. A remote attacker can install a uh, keystroke logger right into the firmware of your keyboard, you know, your, your laptop keyboard. Because like the, that, the keyboard in the MacBook, MacBook Pro, it is a USB keyboard. If you use uh, IO Registry Explorer, you see that there are actually a number of devices on the USB bus. You know, the, the iSight camera, the, the infrared device, the Bluetooth adapter, those are all USB devices. The keyboard, a USB device. So, so like, um, okay. And uh, one thing is whenever you're, uh, you know, writing your own firmware, you can kind of mess up kind of easily. Um, what happened, the most common mistake that I would make is I would make a mistake in the application checksum. So um, then what happens is then the thing is in the, the keyboard is in a bootloader mode. So all you have to do is in order to get around this issue, you just have to change the hex 220 to hex 228. And by the way, the hex 220 for the, the keyboard, the external USB keyboards that Apple sells in the United States, that's what the product ID is. And I have received email from people that it's different in like uh, some countries in Europe. Uh, it's like 221 or something. Everything, everything holds is the same. You just have to change those, these various values. But if we wanted to, if we wanted to be malicious, we can also intentionally brick a keyboard. And uh, it can be done in such a way that the keyboard is completely hosed and the bootloader cannot run. Like it can't even enumerate. And the way to do this is we can do this with just one uh, appropriately placed jump. <laughs> it's just uh, hilarious. If, uh, if anybody wants a, a demo of this, I'm happy to, to give, the, uh, give the demo. And just, uh, it'll cost you like 50 bucks. You have to bring your own keyboard. I don't want to mess up my own keyboards. <laughs> so um, so um, I say that Apple needs to fix this. The only, and the reason why is that because suppose somebody has like a, you know, like a Safari O'Day, what you can do is you can craft like a web page. And whenever a Mac user visits that web page, boom, you can just brick their keyboard. You know, if they're, if they're, if for the desktops, it's not so bad because you can plug another keyboard in. But for the laptops, it really sucks because it doesn't suffice just to replace the keyboard. That uh, Cypress chip on the, for the laptops is actually on the logic board. So then the, 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 the so-called geniuses in the Apple store, they're not gonna be able to fix that. They're just gonna put a new logic board in there. So um, the only thing is now, uh, because of disclosures I've made to Apple, it's a little bit harder to do this because you have to, have, you have to be root now. 
believe it or not, um, up until like um, up until just a couple weeks ago, you only needed to be a an unprivileged user can change the the keyboard firmware on a Mac. It was just like literally, if you had like a Mac OS X server, and then like you could have like a just a, a regular user can just boom change the keyboard firmware. It was just a terrible bug in IO Kit. It was just hilarious. <laughs> in any case. So um, you could also, um, as, I was, as I was saying before, you, know, you install your malware into the keyboard, you can, you can mess with the firmware update, and you can pretty much own that computer like forever. So a um, couple of people I want to thank, uh, Ben Franstill, Script Blue, King Lee, Scott Moulton, Nathan Rittenhouse. OK, so um, are there any questions? Uh, do people want to go back over the slides that I skipped over? Um, I'm happy to talk about it afterwards uh, with anybody. With all, all the, the, those slides that I skipped over, all it is is just, you know, just playing with the, the LED light emitting diode here and uh, messing with enumeration and then, uh, you, know, you know, just disabling a keys on the keyboard just for kicks. It's nothing really fancy. Uh, yes, uh, a question. Uh, two questions. Uh, one, uh, what was Apple's rep response uh, in besides issuing the I.O. kit update? And second question, um, a few years ago, there was a Windows-based rootkit who um, installed itself into the PCI bus firmware. And do you have any further ideas where to hide Mac-based rootkits in besides the keyboard? Okay, um, so the first question about what was Apple's response is, I'm not really sure that they can fix this. The, one of the things is, is because of the, the way the lock bits are set on these certain blocks, so the, what they could do is for the laptops at least, what they could do is they could just do a recall of all the laptops. And then I believe there are probably test points on the logic board where they can reprogram the keyboard firmware. That's one thing that they could do. Or they could like they could have these little devices that are used in prototyping to you know connect to the pins of the chip and then uh, reprogram it. If it was like a, a BGA packaging, then they, they would, Apple would be in trouble. But uh, it's, it is possible for Apple to fix it, just that it would cost a lot of money, and I don't think they're going to do it. And your second question was about what other places for uh, rootkits. Yeah, I've been uh, looking into that. Uh, you, you were saying something about, what was it, a PCI or something? Yeah, it, um, as far as I remember, it was like four years ago, a PCI-based uh, rootkit who installed itself into the PCI bus. I don't remember. Oh, the are you talking, I think you're talking about like John Heisman's uh, stuff. Um, yeah, what um, what did he? I think his stuff was like using like ACP and these kind of things. Um, yeah, um, one of the things is like a Max, you know, like the the boot up process is different from PCs. You know, they Apple for whatever reason they they must have gotten bamboozled by Intel and they they use EFI and stuff. Um, I'm not sure about that. Those kinds of um, uh, I, to tell you the truth, I'm not really very familiar with EFI. So like, um, yeah, I would just ask John Heisman. <laughs> yeah. um, are there other uh, questions? Uh, yes. Uh, is this upgrade process uh, also controlled by this uh, uh, application on the on the chip on, in the keyboard? Because if you can disable uh, as an attacker, if you can uh, disable the, the update, then uh, my question is whether Apple could uh, improve the, uh, this process by implementing some kind of signature, if possible, oh, um, like signing the code of the update. Oh, um, for like the keyboards that are already out there, I suppose they could push out an update and they they could they could disable further updates. That is one thing. But if like the attacker has already put their own code in there, if I were gonna like do this to somebody's keyboard, I would change like the vendor ID and product ID and make it look like there's some other keyboard attached. And then there's nothing that that can be done to that person. They're they're screwed. And um, they, they I think they they probably like, one of the things with these external keyboards is that you can't take them apart easily. If you're gonna take it apart, it's it's gonna be it's gonna be damaged. So you can't just like uh, you can't just like uh, attach things to test points and or attach things to the microcontroller. You have to do it through this bootloader, and um, you know I haven't like really tried to do it myself. It's you know there's um, you know um, 
they may or may not be able to do something about it. I, I'm not sure. Uh, um, I don't know if I answered your question. Uh, okay. Are there other uh, questions? Okay. So uh, if anybody, you know, if you have, if you have your laptop and you want to play around with this thing, uh, uh, feel free. I, I'm very happy to demo this thing. I'm, I'm, so, okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you.